Welcome to today's Friday Transportation Seminar. Um, we've been host, co-hosting this with the School of Urban Planning and the School of Civil and Environmental Engineering for many years now. Um, and we're excited to welcome today's speaker, um, Gon Dr. Goncalo. Um, you can take it off. It's a difficult name. <laughs> <laughs> can I, where, where can I switch the slides? It's this one? Um, yep. It's operational, I hope. Mm, maybe not on yet. So I have this difficult name. It's not Goncalo, it's Gonzalo. It's like in the French, you have this C with uh, with Cedil in French and also Portuguese, I think also Turkish. So it's read like an S. It's a Portuguese name, as I was saying, I'm, I'm from Lisbon. I studied there, I worked there, and then five years ago, I moved to the Netherlands uh, to work at this university, Delft University of Technology, well known by this acronym, TU Delft. And um, I'm working at this department, Department of Transport and Planning. Oh, you are ruining my surprise. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> Don't worry. Um, so I'm also uh, leading this lab, which is called Heat Lab, Research on Electric and Automated Transport. So we have such a huge department that we decided to divide in units, in labs, according to topics. And one of the topics that I'm doing more research about is electric mobility and uh, automation, automated vehicles. And this is what I am going to talk about uh, in this presentation today. It's about uh, vehicle automation. We're doing a lot of research about that, not just at UDELF, but in other universities and other research institutions. I can switch with the keyboard if you, yeah, no problem. Or with the mouse, yeah, no problem. Just turn it here. So I, I always like to start yeah, with uh, presenting the city where I'm coming from, the city of Delft, very lovely city, kind of smallish, 100,000 inhabitants more or less. It's very famous for the Delft pottery. Actually, the university is almost the size of uh, the city. So it's that huge. It's very important for our city. Um, I just wanted to show something about the bicycle infrastructure since this university is well known by the um, cycling research. I'm not going to talk about uh, this, this type of research, but to show you, of course, that the Netherlands is famous for this fantastic infrastructure that we have to support uh, the bicycle usage. And what you're seeing is the underground parking for bicycles uh, in Delft. There's something similar in Utrecht, Amsterdam, uh, The Hague, and also uh, uh, Rotterdam. Um, so this is the campus of the university, quite huge. We are a technical university, so we only have engineering. Actually, we also have architecture and we also have management, but everything is connected to technology. I'm at the faculty of civil engineering and we have a lot of departments, water management, construction, and we also have the department of transport and planning. We are possibly the biggest department of transportation research in Europe, one of the biggest in the world, a lot of faculty studying all types of uh, transportation and issues and problems. Uh, I'm going to brag a bit uh, in terms of rankings, you know, when the rankings go in the direction of what you want, we show them, otherwise we don't show them. So we are in this ranking, the Shanghai ranking has a topic on transportation science and we are in the third position, we have been in the first, let's see what happens uh, this year. It's kind of difficult to beat the Chinese, they are really, very strong now, but indeed this kind of shows the importance of two Delft uh, in transportation research. Not just my department, but there's other um, faculties doing um, research in transportation. We are probably the most broad, touching a lot of topics uh, in civil engineering, but you also have technology policy and management working with multi-actor processes, decision-making, uh, choices, uh, and also mechanical engineering, they work a lot with logistics. They work a lot, for example, with the port of Rotterdam, which is the biggest port uh, in uh, Europe. So I, I like to recognize that uh, this result of TU Delft is not just about our department, uh, other departments. Um, so I always like to start with the main problem in transportation. This is actually a picture from the city of Detroit in the beginning of the 20th century. You see the 40 model everywhere we already have some traffic congestion and of course that later we are not able to solve these problems i'm showing something that you have 
probably seen this as being in the United States, the Thanksgiving in LA, all this movement of cars. Of course, this is not the, the reality uh, all over the world. Europe probably has been uh, able to face this in another way with more public transport. And also in the United States, there's different realities. Portland is quite different from uh, LA. But indeed, we have a problem of this massive usage of private, uh, um, of private vehicles. I mean, it was very difficult at that time to forecast and understand that this was going to happen. You know, there was not really transportation planning or transportation science in the beginning of the 20th century. So imagine that we could have imagined uh, this future and we could have somehow tried to avoid this type of land use occupation and uh, transportation system uh, performance. So it's very important, for example, what we're doing with automated vehicles because we want to avoid exacerbating this, this kind of problems. And this is only going to get worse in a sense because urbanized regions are growing everywhere. And I always like to point for China because they have, in absolute terms, they have the highest number of people in urban areas, but percent-wise, it's only 42% of the people yet. So they are still joining the main cities and they are creating these huge conurbations like uh, Beijing, I was teaching there for one month. It's, it's crazy, that's not a city anymore. I mean, the, the travel time that people face every day, even with uh, the underground facilities that they have there, it's a lot of people living uh, in the same place. So it's in cities that we have the biggest challenges. Another thing that I would like to talk is about the aging process. This is happening a lot in Europe, also Japan. Uh, people are getting older and this is going to make a change uh, in terms of mobility. We have to supply mobility to these people. This is the median uh, age in each country and how it's evolving has evolved and how it is projected to evolve. So you see like 50% of the people having an age above this number. And this is only getting worse uh, in Europe and we need to face this uh, reality. Other things that are happening that are quite surprising is that maybe people don't want to own so much cars uh, like uh, uh, before. This is some values from the United States. I also heard some other opinions about this, that maybe this was temporary, but indeed some, uh, uh, we have seen some results of people not wanting to buy cars and maybe they are using cars with Uber and Lyft uh, systems, but uh, buying cars, maybe not so much as uh, before. And indeed, I mentioned Uber. I mean, everybody knows what's Uber. You know best than me because you're probably using it uh, much more. In the Netherlands, there's Uber, but it's not like it has a massive usage. So the TNCs have been kind of controlled. There's, there's rules of how these TNCs can operate in Europe, um, and here, less so. So uh, indeed, this is a different reality. We have these private companies that are for profit, and they are supplying a lot of mobility. They say they are not transport companies, but they are providing transportation and they are making a big change on our networks. So you have to see uh, what this represents for the future of mobility in cities and for the sustainability of those uh, cities. Give back public space. That's something that has happened in Europe in the 70s. Um, people want to use public space for walking, for cycling. This is much more healthy. It's much more beautiful, even more attractive to have these city centers. This is the city of Copenhagen, but you can see similar situations in Amsterdam and other uh, North European countries, but also in South Europe, there has been uh, an amazing uh, process of converting the city centers. And of course, here in the United States, you also have um, good examples for that. Portland, for sure, in terms of the bicycle usage. Technology, even if people are not going to own a car, they are going to have a cell phone in their pockets, a smartphone, a tablet, and this is a major revolution in the way you are providing mobility, but also information about mobility, usage of public transport, no excuse anymore for not knowing how to travel from A to B using public transportation. So we have to use this uh, to our advantage to uh, provide a more sustainable mobility. This is happening very fast. You see how the landlines evolved in terms of adoption here in the United States, but then you compare it to the smartphones, like this exponential growth. So technology is adopted very fast, and we also have then to be very fast in understanding what are the impacts. So what we do in uh, our department is that we do mostly quantitative studies. 
okay? And in quantitative studies, we do a lot of transportation modeling. We do it for uh, traffic networks. Traditionally, it's a department that is very strong in terms of uh, modeling traffic. But we, that's, that's our approach, is to connect data, empirical data, observing reality, and then build models that allow us to understand that reality. Ultimately, what you want is to be able to forecast and, and see what would happen uh, if you do something in the system, right? Sometimes the models are not that perfect and no model is perfect as we know. So that's sometimes quite difficult to really have a good forecast of what's going to happen with, for example, automated vehicles. But as I usually say to my students, it's not just about now running the model, pressing the button and looking at a certain key performance indicator. It's about building the model and understanding what are the important components of the system. And by doing that, you understand much better the system and you are much better prepared to take good decisions in terms of uh, transportation uh, planning. So that's, I would say, uh, our approach. So automated driving is not going to be different in terms of what we are doing in our department. Um, automated driving is something that in the Netherlands has been subject of research, not just in these last five years. For example, the, the head of my group, Bart Van Aram, I'm going to talk a bit about him. He has been doing research on uh, a consulting uh, institution or let's say research institution in the Netherlands called TNO for almost like two decades or more than that on vehicle automation, but now it's becoming a hype. You know, so everybody's talking about vehicle automation. You go to TRB in Washington and, and the last four years is crazy with the sessions about uh, uh, vehicle automation. But that's good because we need to figure out what's going to happen, what are the possibilities, opportunities and, uh, and threats. Um, what is automated driving? I mean, most of you probably have a notion of what is automated driving. It's a car that drives itself, but maybe it's not only that because you have different levels of vehicle automation. So level zero, no automation. And then it happens that cars today already can uh, help you make some decisions of keeping the lane, of overtaking. These kind of things are also uh, vehicle automation uh, systems. But what I'm more interested about is really this, this evolution towards the car that drives itself. And there's a level five, which I call the dream. It's when you don't care anymore about anything in terms of driving inside the car. You don't need to have a driving wheel even because you can go from Amsterdam to Berlin with one of these cars and you don't need to care. So for me, this is the dream. You cannot guarantee this at all yet. But there is high automation, level four, and this means full automation under some operational design domains, okay? In a, in a city center or in a specific freeway, or maybe you segregate the path of a bus and you say, here, it's full automation. So this level five, yes, this is, this is already here, okay? And I, I can show you an example about that uh, in the Netherlands. Lots of impacts of vehicle automation. I, we started doing this work of mapping uh, the impacts of vehicle automation. We published, a, uh, actually it's not a, a paper on a journal, it's in a, um, a book. And then actually this guy afterwards, Dimitris Milakis, he continued doing this research. He has a very nice paper where he explains better and uh, evolves this Ripple model. The Ripple model basically saying that there's more immediate impacts of vehicle automation but then there's more long-term impacts of vehicle automation. So more short-term would be, um, for example, cost of a vehicle, cost of traveling, but then more long-term, long you would have the economy, you would have the social equity, um, public health, these kind of aspects, okay? It's, it's, it's a framework to help us understand the complexity of what you're talking about. <clears throat> Well, but yes, you can use vehicle automation in different contexts, uh, but it's, it's important to ask from, for example, from the cities what they want from vehicle automation, not just say, okay, the technology allows you to do this. What do we need from vehicle automation? When you ask the cities, it's very interesting to see that they really don't see private automated vehicles. What they want uh, is not even mass transportation with automated vehicles, it's more the last mile and fast mile and first mile connection. Okay, of course, maybe it's depending on the cities, but 
Uh, in the Netherlands, we have such a high quality public transport with the trains, with the trams. What's missing is this last mile connection, okay? Uh, and there is like very low density in a lot of areas in, in the Netherlands. So you need to provide this, um, this connection. So that's what the cities want. You know, these are our famous trains there, high frequency, very good connections between the main cities. Really, a, I was really amazed when I moved to the Netherlands, you know, coming from Portugal, the things are not that fantastic. They're not bad, but they are not so good as in the Netherlands. So high frequency, but still it's impossible to make connections with these trains to everywhere, you know. So people are talking about vehicle automation uh, and uh, uh, how can we use this? Uh, where are we going to implement? Actually has been implemented already. And this system has been in operation, actually not since 2005, since 1999, we have automated vehicles in the Netherlands making a first mile, last mile connection uh, between a metro station and an office park in the city of Rotterdam. Okay, and now it's going to the third generation of the vehicles. This is the second generation of vehicles. They are still there. They kind of look like buses because this was a requirement uh, from the city that they didn't look like strange to people, but uh, you know, so they wanted something more fast forward and this was not approved. But now the new vehicles are looking much, much better. This is a company called To Get There, a Dutch company. They have been bought now, but uh, they have produced this system. They have been in operation for 20 years. They have transported already millions of, of, of passengers, you know. It is segregated, you see. It's totally segregated. No cars, although it has some intersections where there's conflict with bicycles and with pedestrians. So then what happens is that there is a, a sign and then this is closed and the vehicle passes and then open again and the bicycles can cross uh, the path. So what we are doing with all these experiments now, and this is the easy mile vehicle, the famous easy mile vehicle, there's other vehicles, the Oli vehicle, et cetera. What we are trying to do is going beyond uh, the segregated paths, okay? So go to open roads, but this is a big challenge, okay? Facing normal traffic intersections with a lot of cars, all the cyclists in the Netherlands, pedestrians, kids, this vehicle belongs to this project called WePods that we, started running uh, four years ago, connecting a train station to the campus of the University of Wageningen. It's still running more in the campus and not really doing the full route because there's a lot of issues still, safety issues. And you cannot have an accident because if you have an accident, that's it. That's the end of the story for vehicle automation. So the Netherlands takes care of uh, safety a lot. So yes, the country wants to be the first country in terms of vehicle automation, but always with safety. Uh, we don't want to have any accidents that give an excuse to delay the development of the technology. So now I'm going to move to a bit of my uh, own research. And I've been working a lot with the value of travel time. Why? Because, I mean, several things can change with vehicle automation, but one of the things that can change that we are talking about is your experience of traveling in an automated vehicle, okay? Public vehicle, private vehicle, it can be different, but it's about a different experience because the interiors of the vehicles can be uh, uh, redesigned. If it's your private car, you are not driving it anymore. So what is it? It's like a, a living room, right? So this is a totally different uh, reality for what we are doing today inside um, a vehicle. So what is the value of time? Maybe most of the people know what is the value of, of time here, but it's basically how much money I'm willing to spend to decrease like 10 minutes of my uh, travel time, okay? And the idea is that if this value is lower if you feel more comfortable, because if I feel very good inside the transportation mode, I'm not going to pay a lot of money to get rid of 10 minutes, okay? So whenever you see lower values is because it's attractive. Well, this is the simple explanation because it depends on a lot of other factors. It's going to depend on the mode of transportation. It's going to depend on your own characteristics, if you are rich, if you are poor. So yes, I recognize all of that, but there should be a, uh, an average. So there's differences, and I can show you the differences between the countries, for example. It's quite connected with the economy, with the salaries of people. So that's why you see Portugal in a lower rank compared with the Netherlands and Germany 
course. If you have a high salary, then the time that you're spending inside the vehicle is going to make a, a bigger difference uh, in your life. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to be the first ones to estimate the value of travel time inside automated vehicles. And there was this opportunity of doing a study about the first last mile connection to train stations in the Netherlands and doing some choice modeling, uh, giving people uh, a stated preference survey to understand uh, first if people really would like to use the, the system, but also to estimate these kind of indicators like the value of travel time and compare it with the other modes and see what we can conclude. We were expecting a very low value of travel time. So yes, people would love to use it. They would do a lot of things, read the newspaper, work, whatever. So we gave them this experiment. You have a rail trip and then you have different options of egressing and you have uh, an option of using the private car. Okay. So this is how we presented the options to people. You know, we can be very critical about stated preference. Okay, I can accept all criticism. Yeah, what is the realism of the experiment? How do you present the values to people? Yes, we have to take care about that. And I, I think that we did the experiment well, but there's always these, these problems. But my view on that is that uh, the, having this information is better than having zero information about what's going to happen with uh, automated vehicles, but you have to follow the rules, the best practices of doing this. Um, so we presented these options, and then we estimated the value of travel time for these different uh, egress modes. And what you see here uh, is uh, actually a bit of a surprise because you have here the automated vehicle, and actually uh, on average was higher than the private car. Um, and this was a surprise. We really wanted, and we estimated models. Yeah, you, you know, you estimated more and more models, but the result was always the same. We are trying to force something to happen that was never going to happen with the data that we got. So this actually showed us that people were not really perceiving great advantages on riding this automated vehicle for a, a last mile connection. Different justifications for that. It's a short trip. 10 minutes, 15 minutes, what can you do in that trip? Is it that different from a, a, a bus? They don't see, it will be a big difference. And moreover, we are forgetting something, is that we did this survey with a very broad sample of people in the Netherlands. We didn't just ask these questions to uh, academic people, you know, that would be the, the first big mistake that we would do. And actually people are distrusting vehicle automation general people you know if you ask what about the car without the driving you oh, come on is this can i trust that you know there's many different people lower lower education people medium i mean maybe even higher education uh i don't want to create a prejudice here about people and their education levels but that's the reality you have a lot of developed countries here south korea japan us germany yeah percentage of consumers who feel full self-driving vehicles will actually not be safe this, this plays a role. If I don't trust it, why am I going to choose something that I don't trust, that I don't believe in? So we are sure that this also plays a role, but it's evolving quite fast because more and more people are talking about vehicle automation. It's coming in the newspapers, not just in uh, research um, papers. So this was the public transportation side, so, so to speak, but I also, started doing research on private automated vehicles, okay? There is this hype that everybody says, the future is shared vehicles, okay? And then there's this news, owning a car will soon be a thing of the past. This is a, a piece on The Guardian. Uh, this, of course, is a very good clickbait. Everybody clicks, what's going to happen? This is a big change. And then you read, it's like, I don't know, four paragraphs or five paragraphs of general things that he says about the future. I don't know the guy. I hope he excuses my <laughs> accusations. But I, I'm in this, I, I, I'm with Mark Twain. You know, the reports of my death have been greatly exaggerated. So I think there's going to be a lot of desire. Maybe people are not going to have access to it because governments decide not to give them. But there is going to be a desire for private automated vehicles, you know? And we are even selling this idea that we are going to have private living rooms. Right? So, so why would I share a living room with another person? Right? Now I want to have, maybe it's not the design, uh, only the external design of, of my car, the Ferrari against the, I don't know, another brand. It's also about the internal design of your vehicle. So maybe the, the, 
uh, the car makers are going to compete for the best interior design, you know? And uh, I can be reading a book, I drop my book, and the next day I'm going to pick up the book again, you know? So that's, that's very different if the, the vehicle is shared. You lose this uh, privacy. So we wanted to look at, again, the value of travel time of um, these private automated vehicles, right? This almost seems like marketing that I'm selling the future with automated vehicles, like we never have a good experience. That's a lie because actually people like to drive, right? They have ex a good experience. A lot of people have a good experience with driving. You have your music, etc. But yeah, this could be the future. I could have some leisure inside the car. Uh, I could uh, also have meetings uh, with other people, but also through Skype, the internet. And what we presented to, again, a very broad sample of uh, people, I think 1,400, something like that, uh, people, respondents, was a stated preference experiment where we presented a conventional car that they know they, they have to be drivers, these respondents, and a car that had an office interior and a car that had a leisure interior. So we really wanted to separate the two different types of cars. So this is totally designed for being productive. This is designed for another kind of productivity, to have fun. We even described, you could be playing with your kids. It's very easy to be playing with your kids inside the car uh, in the morning. By the way, this is a commuter trip. That's important to, to say. So we are going for a trip from home to work. And then we estimated the, the, the values, the value of travel time. And again, a surprise, um, we saw that actually the, AV leisure had more or less the same value of travel time than the conventional car. There was a bigger difference on the AV office. It was lower, okay? So clearly the type of activities that you are going to do inside the car is going to play a role on your um, experience inside that vehicle. And again, influencing the VOTT is going to influence the cost benefit analysis of new transportation projects. So this is quite um, critical. So I think this is the only equations that I have in my presentation, this slide and the next. Uh, but we try to explore this from a theoretical perspective and Sergio Haradias from Chile he has a very nice uh, model that uh, deducts the, uh, let's say, the perceived value of travel time. And he came across this result that is very interesting. It's the difference between your salary and the utility of working, this is different. Utility of working is the um, ex experience that you get from working. Some people like to work, right? We, we like to work. <laughs> so you have a good experience beyond the salary, okay? And then you have your utility of traveling, the experience of traveling, okay? So it's a difference between these two. If I have a very good experience of traveling and I don't have a good working experience, this is one thing. This is going to be actually um, quite low. So I want to be inside the car. If I have a very high salary and I have a very good experience of working in my office, in my university, then this is going to be quite high. I want to leave the car. I want to stay at the office at the other place. So what we did is that we adapted this model. I'm not going to show the the deductions, but when, what you can see with a Navy for work or a Navy for leisure is that actually the salary disappears because you don't have uh, an opportunity cost of riding a vehicle. You either get leisure, that's good because you want leisure, you need leisure in your life, or you get work salary. So actually the salary disappears and it seems like it's going to be a fight over the experience that you have in a physical place a leisure place, or the experience that you get in a workplace against what you get inside the car. And this can be very different because one thing is to work, and if we work with computers, maybe we can do it very easily in the car, but what about leisure? What is leisure inside the car? I don't know about you guys, but in my case, I like to, to run, for example, to jog. So I cannot jog inside the car. It's, I heard people saying yes, but I think this is stupid. So that makes no sense, okay? So I think it's very different. So this is going to determine this VOTT uh, in the end. And we can now make this more complex because 
you maybe you can work and have leisure in the same kind of vehicle for sure we have to continue doing research uh, about this this topic okay so this VOTT I have been talking a lot about the VOTT but what does this impact um, our mobility in cities in regions one thing that I mentioned already is cost-benefit analysis and how you measure the value uh, of reducing travel time by building new freeways, etc. This is one of the sides and it's more direct. But another one that I think it's very interesting, and by the way, this is not finalized research whatsoever. Actually, I'm going to be very uh, honest with you. It's the result of a master thesis um, that we have uh, supervised there by a, a guy that I'm going to mention his name. Um, but it was something that we really wanted to do, it was to see if we can have a land use change by the fact that you can have vehicle automation in the future, okay? So how is land use going to change uh, in the Netherlands? Well, land use is quite complex. It's types of land use, etc. So we focus more on population density, how population density could change across the, the territory. And we didn't study the whole country, it's a small country, by the way, 17 million inhabitants, but this would be a bigger challenge. Uh, so we studied um, another city, which is called uh, Utrecht. Um, so you know this, probably this diagram, this very famous uh, diagram that connects transportation and land use and how you have this feedback loop. This is actually dynamic complexity, right? You, you, you change something in one part of the system, this is going to lead to changes in exactly the same part of the system. This is unfortunately the reality in most of the systems that we are trying to manage. And that's why it makes it so uh, complex. And it's not as simple as this diagram because there's even more feedback loops. Uh, I like this thing that uh, Martin, it's his name, Martin Hollisteller has done because it's not that you provide accessibility and then land use changes automatically because nobody's going to allow uh, developers to build buildings in natural parks. So there's a lot of constraints and the Netherlands has a big history in terms of uh, uh, urban planning. So the, the country, all the countries planned, sometimes a bit boring, but it's very beautiful country at the same time because everything is very well organized. So there's the planning component that we cannot forget, the integration of transportation systems and uh, land use. So what I think it's very innovative in, in his work is that uh, most of the people are looking at how vehicle automation affects the experience of traveling, the VOTT, and how it makes it easier to travel farther away. But he also looked at another process, which is since mobility is changing, the vehicles are automated, there's a lot of free space that could be uh, converted to other usage, okay? This is a very extreme situation because it's the main train station in the city of Utrecht, and actually it's the biggest station in the Netherlands because it's quite central, making connections to <clears throat> all of the country. If you make this disappear and everything is about automated vehicles, you have a lot of space that you could use either for green or for example, to densify. This is the blocks in Barcelona put in Utrecht. <laughs> so we wanted to see what would happen in this region of Utrecht. It's a province, the country is divided in, in provinces, but the city of Utrecht is really the major urban center of the province. There's other smaller cities, but this is the urban core. Um, and yes, there's people living in all of these places and traveling to all different places, not just to Utrecht, but to Amsterdam, to Rotterdam, The Hague, etc. And it belongs, uh, I don't know, maybe you are curious about that, Utrecht it belongs to a region that is called the Randstad. There's even a big company on human resources called Randstad. Um, that is Utrecht, The Hague, Rotterdam and Amsterdam. This is about 7 million inhabitants. And believe me, there's people traveling every day from city to city. So they prefer to live in one city and they go to the other one. So it's kind of this constellation of cities that forms a bigger conurbation. He came up with scenarios of how automated vehicles are going to be used. This is not exhaustive of all types of usages that you can do of automated vehicles, but he was kind of a more extreme with his scenarios. First scenario, everything is shared automated vehicles, no more public transport, okay? Great experience 
uh, in terms of uh, um, riding this vehicle, so the value of travel time decreasing um, a lot. This is one reality. Another reality is you keep the public transport that you have, but there's a lot of uh, attraction for private automated vehicles. So a lot of usage of private automated vehicles and they are very comfortable. So indeed, we were able to make these vehicles very attractive with this kind of fancy interiors. Another scenario here is level four automation. So there is no full automation everywhere. So in some freeways, you can have automation in other parts, you don't. The VOTT, the VOTT doesn't change so much. So they were not really able to deliver cars that are so fantastically um, comfortable. And then there is another scenario called decline where it's all about private uh, automated vehicles, no public transport, and actually not a great experience, just the same experience that you have with cars uh, as today. These things have to be transformed into inputs because we are talking about uh, modeling. And uh, for example, the VOTT, here it is, one of the major inputs for our model because it's going to determine if it is easy or, uh, or more or less attractive to travel by, by car. But other things that we had in consideration were the extra trips, empty trips of shared uh, automated vehicles, for example, plus 20% in the first scenario of transformation, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not going to explain all of the indicators. The question is, what kind of model can you do to model this? <clears throat> As I said, cities are complex phenomenon, multiple feedback loops, high dynamic complexity. It's very difficult to tackle everything. But he came up with an approach that resembles the LUT models that you probably, some of you know. It's not a full LUT model for sure. Come on, this was a master student. So <laughs> it was impossible to develop uh, a full LUT model, but it has a lot of these properties. So he realized that vehicle automation is going to affect accessibility, but also spatial quality by taking advantage of the free space, okay? And these two things actually are very important for the choices that we make in terms of where I'm going to live, what type of neighborhood am I going to live, and can I get there? So accessibility and also urban environment are important in this type of models. So there's these three components, an accessibility model, a spatial quality, not model, it's what he called research by design. And by the way, he graduated in architecture and in civil engineering. So he has a background on design and also a choice model, uh, an agent-based model for choosing uh, houses. So these are the three main components. The accessibility model is very traditional. It's a transport demand model like, uh, like VZoom or M, or there's different kinds of software for doing that. In the Netherlands, there's this software developed there in the Netherlands called Omnitrans. So you have the different zones of the region, you have the trips and you can model traffic congestion, you can model uh, mode choice. It has been validated by the region. So they use this model to make decisions on their uh, region. What did we need to add there? Of course, changing the value of travel time for scenarios with the automated vehicle. Uh, things like the empty rides, we needed to put those empty rides there. We needed to have the parking concepts, for example, in one of the scenarios, which is the growth scenario, we assume that the vehicles, the private vehicles arrive at the destination, the work destination, and then they move to the outskirts to external parking. This needed to be modeled there. Uh, as well, and of course, changes on road capacity because of the efficiency of traffic. Most of the scenarios lead to a growth uh, in uh, uh, travel times because there's major changes happening in terms of the VOTT, uh, and then more people choosing these uh, vehicles, either shared or private. That's just a picture showing the accessibility to jobs. It's not surprising that the biggest accessibility is the seat of Utrecht because it has the uh, greatest number of, of jobs there. I think this is the most interesting part of this uh, piece of work is this research by design, okay? And it's not objective because design is not objective, right? That's something that we know. It depends on the minds of everybody. Uh, yes, there's methods to develop design, 
but different people can come up with different things. So what he decided to do is to classify the different types of urban occupations in the region. Uh, and actually this was not a lot of work because we already had some classification done by another uh, consulting uh, group. So we had the types of urbanization that exist uh, in the Netherlands from city centers to rural areas. He applied this to all of the areas of the region of Utrecht. Just to give you some uh, depiction of the different types, you can go from center urban plus to rural areas, they are quite different. And it's also different, the potential to change this uh, with the automated vehicles. So he looked at different examples of the different types of neighborhoods. He studied those neighborhoods. He looked at the typical streets that you have there, local streets, arterial roads, okay? And he redesigned those, okay? This is just an example of what he could do from the current situation with a situation with only shared uh, vehicles. Um, so he then did this to all of the types of urbanized regions for the four scenarios. In some cases, changes are actually quite, uh, quite interesting and, and quite, uh, quite different. Uh, in other cases, the potential to change is not a lot because nothing really changes so much in terms of the mobility system. Then he associated that, those changes, with a premium, with a higher quality of the urban space. Again, this is his decision, right? Another person could come up with different levels. It's not that you have huge premiums. One of the things that Martin found it's not surprising to me, is that the public space is already high quality in the Netherlands, a lot. So you're already putting cars out of a lot of places. So it's not like you can change completely uh, the areas. And of course, it's going to depend on the different scenarios. Just to finish, this is not very important, but it's the choice modeling for, for houses. It's an agent-based model, and it's based on another model that exists in the Netherlands done by other researchers called Thierry. And it's a, a house choice model that depends on the cost of the houses, the neighborhood quality, the income of the person. This is kind of classic uh, modeling. You can run this model with a do nothing scenario. Okay, so what would happen if we don't change anything on the mobility system? And you see that there's a trend of losing population in the main uh, urban area of the region, which is Utrecht. This trend, uh, Martin was able to explain it through the fact that people are searching for cheaper houses. They are very expensive in Utrecht and getting more and more expensive. And they are also searching for more space. The houses, the built environment in these urban cores in the Netherlands is quite old, quite small houses, you know? So this also plays a role. And then he ran the simulation with the different scenarios. I'm going to focus more on these, these three here. Well, in the transformation scenario where it's shared automated vehicles everywhere, there's a positive result in terms of containing the people getting out of the urban uh, area of Utrecht. Apparently, this has to do with the fact that you have opportunities of redeveloping the city center with these shared automated vehicles. And this, despite the fact that indeed you have these shared automated vehicles, you can bring more people because of the fact that the quality, the public space has improved. But in this scenario, he came up with improvements in almost all kinds of neighborhoods. In this other scenario, in this growth scenario, the opportunities were higher in the city center. So because there is this relative difference of what you can do in the city center of Utrecht and what you can do in the outskirts, then you see people moving inside Utrecht, showing the importance of this uh, urban space uh, uh, redesign. Then this decline scenario, is a scenario where you are basically uh, losing a lot of population. Actually, not as bad as a do-nothing scenario. Why? Because travel times are increasing so much that actually this is making people trying not to travel so much. That's the problem with traveling so much is that you have so much traffic congestion that actually you keep pe people uh, inside. It's one of these um, feedback loops that can happen in uh, urbanized regions. 
this is just a summarizing of the results so that people can check afterwards when I when you check the presentation. I have a disclaimer. There's a lot of things missing, okay? Housing development. We don't have new uh, buildings being built in the region. We assume that these areas can be densified even without the buildings, but we have to have developers. Firm relocation, okay? Some more advanced models, they relocate the companies. The companies also decide to move to other places. And in the Netherlands, it's quite dynamic. Companies are moving everywhere. They leave a building, they go to another one, no problem. Demographics and uh, economic development. Co economy growing, going lower, this is going to, of course, affect a lot the results. So I'm almost finishing my presentation. Uh, this is Martin accepting a prize for his research. I was very happy that he got like this uh, prize of best uh, uh, <clears throat> master thesis given by this organization. It's actually the first time they give the prize. So we'll see what happens in the future with other students from TU Delft but uh, I was quite happy that he got this. So as I told you, he dabbled, uh, majored in uh, architecture and also civil engineering. I'm not going to talk a little, uh, about more topics that I've done research about. I'm particularly proud of vehicle routing, private automated vehicles routing, and also public uh, automated vehicles routing. Uh, we are publishing papers on that. In some cases, we have published already. And I, I really uh, work a lot on operations research, so optimization problems, location problems. So how many vehicles do you need for first mile, last mile connections? How do you, um, what does it change in terms of uh, uh, the performance of the system if the vehicles have to be electric, they have to charge, how should they charge the vehicles? All these more detailed operational issues of the transportation system. I'd like to recognize that Automated vehicles research is done by a lot of people uh, at uh, our uh, university and beyond because we collaborate a lot with other uh, universities. Um, so a lot of these people work more on the traffic side, modeling traffic capacities, traffic congestion. So BART has been leading research on automated vehicles since 15 years, I think, at Delft or more or less like that. So I always like to recognize his role on this. But then you have a lot of people working on different topics, like for example, traffic safety is very important. Hanin Farah, just next to my face there, she works a lot with traffic safety, interaction between humans and cyclists and the automated vehicles. Very nice research that she does on that. So, and before finishing, I just want to <laughs> advertise a conference that is going to happen before the conference that Kelly is organizing here. So it's not coinciding, no, no problem there. Uh, and it's not about uh, land use transportation models for sure. It's more uh, actually supported by IEEE. And we have these three keywords, connected automation, sharification, electrification, but we are open to all kinds of topics uh, that uh, deal with transportation um, science. And that's my last slide. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. So hi, I'm Kelly Cliftade. I'm a professor of civil engineering and the associate dean of research in the College of Engineering. And that's important because this is the end of research week here at PSU. And we're celebrating all kinds of research in Gonzalo. We were lucky enough to um, have him here to talk about something that's on all of our minds in transportation, which is AVs. Yes. Um, so, uh, Chris Monsier, who is a professor and chair of civil engineering, uh, we thought we would uh, have a, a very short panel about this topic. Um, and so one thing that I think about, uh, particularly in the context of the Netherlands, and it's great that you're here from the Netherlands because we have a study abroad and so you have uh, opportunity for students to come over and see what you're doing firsthand. But um, as you mentioned, like the Netherlands is a small country. It's very well connected by rail. Um, which may not be an automated vehicle, but I can certainly multitask, I can work, I can do all kinds of leisure activities, maybe not lay down on the floor and sleep in <laughs> cars, yeah. but... You better not yeah. do that. <laughs> um, you've also invested a lot in sustainable transportation, so uh, walking and, and cycling. Yep. So what do you think the market for AVs are gonna be in a place like the Netherlands, which I think is quite different than the US where we're very much auto-oriented? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's really a, a very good question. And that's, that's also a research on question for the minds of the planners there 
We have a lot of organizations in the Netherlands that are concerned about this, of course, the ministry. We also have advisors to the ministry. We have this Knowledge Institute of Mobility. Everybody's trying to figure out what's about vehicle automation and the Netherlands. And I told you, we are investing a lot. There was this ranking this week or last week about uh, readiness for vehicle automation. And apparently the Netherlands is in the first position. The United States was in the third position. So it's really surprising since we have this fantastic public transportation system. I mean, that's why these first mile, last mile connections are so important. We are seeing regions investing a lot on first, last mile. That's what they really want. So I was very happy to find this, this chart that I showed you, which is cities all over the world that answered the survey. But I would say that in the Netherlands, for sure, it's 100% of the cities, that's what they are searching. First and last mile, low density areas. Why? Because it's quite expensive to provide accessibility to low density areas. We have a fantastic system of buses. They are mostly run by private companies with a concession, okay? Like Transdev is a big multinational company, but they are very expensive. So in the peak hours, they are packed. Off peak, they are totally empty. So they are very expensive and the cities, the regions are searching for options to face, uh, to face this reality. More than that, they realize that, I mean, us as citizens, maybe we want to have private automated vehicles. Should we allow that? So they want to understand if this should be allowed or not should be forbidden. And I don't know if you saw this in the news, but Amsterdam just decided that in 2030, they are going to go car free, 100%. Okay, it's not a very big city. Okay, it's a small capital compared with other capitals, but it's a major breakthrough. Uh, so car car free means also automated vehicles, right? They are also cars. So uh, maybe you'll have these public transport uh, uh, pods going around. Yes, maybe, but we have to study what is the impacts of, of that. And moreover, it's a country that is very uh, oriented towards innovation and selling stuff. Dutch are very good with business. So they want to be the first as well to sell the technology. If there is a, a market for interesting technology, uh, the Dutch want to be uh, on the forefront of that as well. You want to sell it to us? <laughs> <laughs> Preferably. <laughs> you wanna... Yeah, I, I, I guess my, <clears throat> sort of, my question was along the lines of sort of what you talked about here, there at the end in terms of you know, your models. I'm sort of seeing these uh, for-profit companies uh, providing us uh, floating uh, beds moving all around the city and yeah. kind of the whole system uh, going amok if there's not um, if there's not some uh, larger picture about how this how the entire system works. It basically, if it's a for-profit monopoly, how do we how do we make sure that the city's like that you want to live there? Uh, yeah. It's not a whole bunch of these uh, automated uh, robots driving around yeah yeah i mean um th the netherlands has a very big tradition in planning i was already saying this during my presentation so it's quite hard that you do just what you want in cities or in the country so one good example is uber still uber is not a big thing in the netherlands it exists it's becoming a bit bigger so finally i mean i cannot even find a car in delft a car can come from rotterdam like 12 kilometers from, from the city and pick me up, but it's going to be expensive. So they are always very careful about the impacts that these new technologies and new modes and whatever are going to have. So first they study the things, they use a lot of modeling, okay? A lot of work with the cities, with the citizens and understand what's going to happen. And then they rule, then they are going to regulate how these things are going to work. So it's always the approach, it's not like, Despite the fact that they are very geared towards innovation, it's not like you come up with an idea and the next day you are implementing it and, and that's it, you know? Uh, even car sharing, it exists in, in Amsterdam with a kind of relatively small fleet from car to go. Uh, it exists, yes, but it has not expanded to multi-branding. A lot of companies, they're competing because it, the space doesn't even allow it. The, you know, you have the canals, so the, the road space is not a lot. So they have been always very careful with this. Let's first study and then see how these vehicles can fit our system and make the system more sustainable. I don't know if you are aware of this, but you have this image of the Netherlands as being this bicycle country 
paradise, everything green, everybody going around by bicycle, but it's one of the most congested countries in Europe. You know why? Because yes, in Amsterdam, you don't have a lot of traffic congestion because you protected the city, but then people are traveling from city to city. So in freeways, you have gridlock. Half past four, five o'clock, it's everything stopped in the freeways because they are moving all around, even with the fantastic train system that they have, the rail system. So when I think about the potential of AVs, whether we're talking about Europe or we're talking about the US, we ha have to think about what are the problems we're trying to solve with the technology. Yeah. And so the first one I think is safety. So reducing human error. Uh, <clears throat> second is efficiency. So one is global efficiency. So how can we move all these cars and coordinate their activities in ways that capitalize on extra capacity? Um, and then the other is personal efficiency. So allowing me to multitask, uh, allowing me to, to do more with my own productivity and travel time. And so as we think about this in terms of models, whether we're talking this in terms of policy frameworks, it seems like there's a lot of ways in which this technology could manifest in its form to achieve those, those two ends. So you mentioned difference between personal and shared um, and whether the vehicle itself is private or shared yeah. um, at any given time. And so I think in the way that we frame this in terms of models has a very much a path dependency because we do a study, we, we then create a model based on those parameters of the study, yeah. then we make plans based on those models, and then we make investments and so on. So the context and the framing and the options we present really have an impact in terms of how are we investing and how what is the trajectory of this technology and so i just wonder in the context of your stated preference work and the work of others at delft and elsewhere um, how much are you thinking about the wide range of options within automated technologies to sort of satisfy these two um, problems we're trying to solve well uh, that's a big it's question a <laughs> Uh, well, we are even studying, by the way, automated trains. So we have a group studying automated trains. So it's not just about cars automation. So we are looking at all kinds of uh, possible utilizations. Um, I mean, we are geared towards one goal. It's sustainability. So uh, we need to uh, provide sustainable transportation, not just in terms of, uh, let's say, environment, but also equity. We are looking a lot in equity. So, for example, I've participated in projects where we're looking at automated vehicles to transport handicapped people. So we're looking at all kinds of possibilities of how automated vehicles could uh, improve our quality uh, of life. We always have this, this kind of goal. But I cannot say that we are envisioning all kinds of uh, possibilities of using vehicle automation and maybe even the pitfalls, which is kind of hard to envision them, you know? Sometimes we come across something in terms of uh, traffic safety, a problem with a, with a, with a system, a, a laser or a, or a radar or a camera, but uh, there's a lot of things that we cannot figure out yet. So I think that besides doing the models, what we are trying to do a lot now is moving to the physical space, uh, not just in terms of the traffic safety component, yes, putting really the vehicles interacting with the bicycles and with the pedestrians. I'm sure we are going to learn many new things that we hadn't thought about when we were just in, in our desks. But besides that, as well about the experience, we are trying to redesign, really redesign interiors of vehicles and putting people inside there, having meetings and, and possibly sleeping. We'll see if that's going to happen, but um, at least having some leisure and see if indeed these things are working as we saw or foreseen before or if it's totally different so uh, yes modeling is interesting but we have to go to the reality it's not enough to do for example stated preference surveys but it gives you some clues does anybody in the audience want to ask a question or online no question yep so i'm just curious to know if uh, there is I'm curious to know if there's much, if any collaboration in the Netherlands between your university or other universities and regional and municipal planning authorities in terms of doing some preliminary tests in a lot. ways to incorporate yeah. these findings into into A lot, models. sometimes even too much. That's my, well, I'm being filmed, right? 
<laughs> so it is going to be on, on the internet. Because, I mean, the regions approach to Delft uh, every week. Uh, so I showed the case of the WePods uh, project kind of early. This region wanted to have a transportation system that matched the quality of the university. They are the top university in agricultural research in the world. And they have all these mechanical arms, putting plants, whatever. Uh, so this region approaches, but now it's, it's uh, Amsterdam, it's Rotterdam. For example, Rotterdam has this, uh, Rotterdam and The Hague, they form a kind of expanded municipality. They have uh, what they call the metropolitan region. And they are launching seven pilots, of course, different maturities. Uh, one is a connection to the airport. Another is a connection from a train station to our campus. Another one is a connection in, a, in an area that they are developing in The Hague that is totally new. So a lot of things happening where they really see the value of having the university, but also external consultants that have experience in running these innovation projects. So we, we try to leave that part to these innovation consultants and, and focus more on the research component. But it, it's, it's really multi-stakeholder uh, initiative. Uh, yesterday I was in this conference, the Urbanism Next, organized by the Oregon Univers University of Oregon. You never heard of it? <laughs> uh, and there was this institution from, from the Netherlands called TNO. TNO, I already mentioned, I think, TNO is this research institution that advises uh, and runs projects for uh, the European Commission and also for cities. And they really have this multi-stakeholder approach. They work uh, with psychologists, for example, with all types of uh, expertise to, to run these experiments. Uh, mass, for example, mobility as a service, the ministry launched, also seven, by the way, I think, seven pilots of mass usage in different cities of the Netherlands with different scopes. In one is more about uh, maybe kids for school. Another one is for an office park to manage better the mobility in an office park. Again, it's the city, it's the region, it's the external consultants from TNO, it's the University of TU Delft. But there's other universities who collaborate with, for example, Eindhoven University is also quite well known. Yeah. So I think, oh, go ahead. Um, so thank you for the presentation. It was really interesting. Um, I had a conversation with my Uber and Lyft driver to the airport um, on my last uh, business trip and we talked about automated vehicles and he's like I'm not quite sure what we're waiting for here in the US because the technology doesn't need to be perfect um, it's okay if a few people die <laughs> and so That's... to hear your perception and your perspective from sort of that safety yeah. um, where I think the tolerance for um, the number Excellent. of deaths is pretty much zero, zero. Um, what is preventing the Netherlands from adopting and moving forward with? Safety? What is preventing? Or, I mean, like at what point would you accept the technology and have it proliferate <laughs> within? Uh, this should be the, the minister to, <laughs> to define. When do you really say that something is safe? And uh, I mean, it's, it's about doing a lot of testing. That's piloting. And that's why we have a very open policy for doing piloting. So you have this, this, the vehicle's approval authority uh, in, the, in, the, um, in the country that works together with these pilots to check if we are following a certain number of rules. But if you follow some, a certain number of rules, you can do these pilots. It's just defining the area and then you go to the street. So it's not like to say that we cannot do things. Yes, we can do a lot of things compared with, for sure, with other countries in Europe. Maybe I would say the Netherlands, Sweden, uh, the UK, maybe a bit Germany. These are countries that are investing a lot on that, um, allowing us to do pilots. But you cannot just do pilots by, you know, there's a Tesla vehicle, they say it's automated. No, go to the streets. It's not like that. You have to define the boundaries. What, what is the operational design domain for your vehicle? How are you going to use it? How are you going to make sure that you follow a certain number of steps that are not going to create any incidents? We don't want that. That's, that's basically, but I see a, like a, a different way of thinking, of course, the American way and the European way. And in Europe, for sure, the Netherlands is a bit different. It's very careful on the way things are done in planning. 
All right. Well, we're very careful here in Portland about uh, the way the things are done, and we are over time. So uh, <laughs> thank Gonzalo for an interesting talk. Thank you. And we have, uh, for those in the room and for anybody who's left online, our next talk is Anne Brown. Nope. Nope. Um, our next talk is next Friday. Um, it's a PBOT Lunch and Learn Partnership Seminar. Um, we'll be talking about creative strategies to leverage different funding sources to um, make sidewalk improvement projects a reality uh, and new street improvements. So um, some from the city of Portland will be presenting on how he makes that happen in Portland. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> So you go for for lunch?